Hey, Change Point Kotzebue, Lance Kramer here in Kotzebue, Alaska. It's a, a windy and stormy day. Welcome to everyone. And uh, we're going to be continuing on with our series um, called The Road Out. And it's, uh, it's, uh, we're going to be looking in the book of Exodus. And, uh, you know, I, I, I preached the first sermon on being pressed. I don't know if you remember that, but, um, uh, you know, sometimes this people we're pressed on all sides in our life and uh, whether it be socially or financially or spiritually physically even sometimes and we need to be free right we need to be unstuck even in relationships and so um, so that's what this series really is about is to help people get unstuck in their life and uh, to move forward and to live in God's uh, goodness and so I preached the first sermon on, um, on being pressed and we talked about how uh, the Israelites were pressed by the Egyptians they were they were pressed by Pharaoh and then of course Peach preached this last sermon on the Passover and talked about the deliverance that redemption comes by the blood of the lamb um, that when they put the blood on the doorposts of this lamb uh, on the doorposts of their homes and the angel of death passed over Egypt right uh, then then God would pass over when he sees the blood of the Lamb. Good morning or good afternoon there, Lawrence, Charles, and Angeline Walter. Uh, it's, uh, it's noon here, and it's, uh, we have to remember, we have to spring forward, I guess. And uh, so it's that time, daylight savings time. And so Peach preached on the importance of the Passover last week. And uh, so this week we're getting into what's called the procession. Okay, the procession. What is a procession? A procession is uh, it's a, kind of like this big line of people heading out, right, uh, into freedom. And so that's what we're going to be discussing in the scripture today. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Exodus. And we're in Exodus chapter 13 and uh, looking at verse 17. Exodus 13, 17. So you got your Bibles with you? Uh, from Bethel, Alaska. All right, welcome. And so, you know, um, crossing the Red Sea. All right, let's get into the scripture, shall we? It says here that when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert, uh, des by the desert road toward the Red Sea. And the Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. And so isn't that interesting that God uh, led the people around by the desert uh, toward the Red Sea. And uh, hey, from Fairbanks, hi Tara Greenlaw. Um, so that would seem kind of strange, right? That God is going to lead you to the promised land. The promised land is kind of north and east, right? And uh, you can go straight up into Philistine country and you can be right in the promised land really fast. If you look on the maps, you know from Goshen to Jerusalem, you can. it's a pretty fast trail. In fact, there was a road that was there already. But God didn't want to lead them through there. Uh, the Philistines were still pretty strong, and so he wanted to lead them south and east. And notice that he says it, he led them toward the Red Sea. You know, sometimes in our life we wonder which way God is leading us and why he might be leading us in a particular direction, and we have no idea, right? And that's why there's this thing called faith. <laughs> uh, you know, as a, as a Christian, I'll never forget, um, you know, of course, God led me to him in February 1995. And, and ever since then, it's been a, an interesting journey. And I would often ask God, well, why would you lead me to this place in my life or this place in my life? And later on, I finally realized, you know, that he knows what he's doing. And even though it might not seem like the logical reason to me, uh, to God, something's very logical, and I just have to obey and trust Him in that. And uh, so, we're in Exodus chapter 13, and uh, uh, verse 19 now, it says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. And he said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. And uh, so, isn't that cool that um, Moses is is following through on the promise, you know, right, that he was going to lead 
uh, bring Joseph's bones out of Egypt. He wanted to be buried where he was originally at and um, not necessarily buried so much. Um, what the Israelites would do is they would have their homes and uh, it would be kind of like a multi-level structure and in a particular part of their homes in the Middle East there's a spot where you would keep like these vases with these bones in them. Uh, vases of your of your ancestors and your grandparents and your great grandparents and your great great grandparents and so there's a specific place for those in your home and so that um, um, you know children can know kind of maybe who their family and who their lineage is uh, now oftentimes they would be put in tombs eventually but they would be kept in homes for the most part if they could especially if they couldn't afford a big tomb in a place and so so here Moses is bringing out Joseph's bones, and that's a great sign of honor, right? And um, so, uh, verse 20, After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. And by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by the night in a pillar of fire to, guide, to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. And so, isn't that cool that God would give them uh, during the day this cloud, right, that would go ahead of them. And at night, uh, of course, it's pitch black out. It's not like America where there's street lights everywhere and things like that, and you can see everything. At night in this country, there was nothing. It was pitch black, it just dark, maybe moonlight, starlight. But um, And so during the night, the Lord would, of course, lead them with, with fire by night so that they can see. And uh, it says, neither of these things, right? They, neither of them left their place in front of the people. So chapter 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi uh, Hahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, and there to encamp by the sea directly opposite of Baal Zephon. And Pharaoh will think, The Israelites are wandering around in the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. He says, But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. This is really, an, um, uh, this is a, if you have your Bibles, you want to underline that part where it says, I will gain glory for myself. You see, God uh, hardened Pharaoh's heart many, many times throughout uh, the various plagues. Um, in the previous chapter and uh, so he hardened his heart and he hardened his, and you would think that okay so now that he left the Israelites go that that's the end of him it's not the end of him God hardened his heart one more time right and and so God wants to gain glory for himself through Pharaoh and that's something and so uh, this this is a this is an important aspect for you and I I think to understand is that God wants glory now we might say, man, that's kind of, um, what do you call it, audacious of you, God, to want glory for yourself, right? And we might be wondering, why would he want glory for himself? Well, it's not so much for him so that he can just bask in the glory and say, I'm, I'm a bad dude. Um, it's, it's because he knows that we can't handle any bit of the glory, <laughs> right? And he knows that if we did, of course, we would be, become prideful, we would become arrogant, we would think it's all on us, that um, we're all that in a bag of chips, um, when we're not. And so, so he wants to gain glory for himself through Pharaoh. And so this is important. Now, um, that is like the be-all and end-all of God, is to get glory for himself. From the beginning of, in the Bible, Genesis, to the end in Revelation, and even into the future, uh, into in the New Jerusalem, uh, God wants to have this glory for himself. And that is his purpose statement, I guess, if you will. If God was a business and he had a purpose statement, he would say, um, um, I exist, right, to gain glory for myself. And that's as what is what we exist too is to give him glory right and uh, to glorify him and so um, that is the end in mind in, in the scripture um, Apostle Paul says whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do do it all for the glory of God and so 
again, it's not so that God can be puffed up and say, I have the glory. He, he just knows that we can't, we can't handle any bit of it. And so he needs it, right? And so he says, I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and, and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And so he's doing two things here because, uh, in this exodus. Number one, he wants to gain glory for himself through this event. But secondly, he wants the Egyptians to know that he is Lord. Um, you're going to see that phrase throughout the Old Testament, so that they may know that I am the Lord. You're going to see that over and over and over, and, uh, and it's an important phrase, right? Because it's important for you and I to know that He is the Lord. It is important for you and I to know that God is God. And um, so even in the book of John, right, uh, way, way at the end of John, I'm just going to go ahead and find it and read it. It just kind of came to my mind. But, you know, it's important for you and I to understand, too, um, uh, what the, the, the kind of the purpose, I guess, is of God. And uh, so let me see if I can find it here. I'm using a different Bible than I have. Oh, it says in John chapter 20, um, verse 30 it says this Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book in this book of John it says but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name hey Brian how is it going Bart um, so as you can see here when we when we know who God is when we know who Jesus is it's that's kind of like that starting point, right? And when we eventually will come to believe in Him, and by believing Him in Him, we'll have eternal life, right? Uh, we'll have life in His name. We're gonna have a great life, an incredible life. And so that's the whole thing here: is that God, through this event of the Exodus, not only does He want to gain glory for Himself, but He also wants those Egyptians to know who He is. He wants the whole world to know who He is. That's why this event is written down. It didn't even have to be written down. But it's here for us to read right now. Uh, this event, what, 4,000 years ago. And so it, it's here so that we can say, wow, he is the Lord. He, he led them out of Egypt. He delivered them through these miraculous plagues, right? And he, um, he passed over them. He saved them. There was a distinction between them and the Israelites. And now he's leading them out of this um, this place of slavery and uh, so anyways that's that's those are two important verses there for us to realize verse 5 of chapter 14 good afternoon there Percy welcome it says uh, chapter 14 of Exodus verse 5 when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and they said what have we done we have let the Israelites go and have lost their services so he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. Verse 8, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. And the Egyptians, um, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Harioth. Uh, opposite of Baal Zephon. In verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. And they were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. <laughs> this is crazy, right? This is incredible. Um, <laughs> I this this uh, the, the place of Egypt really represents um, slavery of sin and bondage and sin, and it's and it's it's a place. I guess um, I guess if you're comfortable in it, you know, you you kind of want to return to that. And so here are these people, all of a sudden, you know, after all of these miraculous signs and things, this. I'll tell you what, if, if I had a cloud leading me somewhere in, by day, and if I had a fire leading me somewhere by night, I think I would be kind of pretty convinced, right, that God is pretty powerful. And uh, But here they weren't quite 
convinced. You see, when, when the, um, uh, when, when, when everything came uh, to fruition with these Egyptians coming after them, when, when it was uh, for real, all of a sudden they became afraid and they actually wanted to go back. And that is so much like human beings, isn't it? That when we become a Christian, maybe, and we're, we're, we're moving forward in life, something may come upon our life that cause, causes fear or anxiety or causes doubt. And we say, man, that old life that I had, I didn't have these issues. I didn't have these troubles. I, I can just you know, do my thing and be myself and, you know, and uh, just enjoy my friends and whatever. Um, yeah, you can go back to that. And, and how did that work out for you? <laughs> right? Uh, how did that work out for you in the end? And so here, you know, God is leading them. And, and of course, they're like, uh, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Now, um, hi Easter, welcome. Hi Boomer. Um, this is so cool folks because what what is God calling them out to do, right? What is he calling them out to be? This is so, so important for us to understand. Can you imagine if you were out there in the desert and you've got the Egyptians behind you and you've got this sea in front of you and you're kind of locked into this place, right? And you're thinking, we are in trouble. Uh, there, there is no escape route. We're, we're dead in the water, so to speak. And so, can you imagine them thinking, why, why are we even here? What are we doing? What were we thinking? Right? There are 600,000 men here, which is, means probably about 2 million people in all. And, and I'm sure they're wondering, what, what's going on? So, what's the purpose of this? Well, I just want to read to you. Um, in, in Exodus chapter 19, it says, um, Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. He says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. He says, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Isn't that incredible? He says, these are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. And so what is God doing in this exodus, right? He is delivering his treasured possession. He is, tr he is bringing out his kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And that is what God's desire is for them, right? His identity for them to be God's people, God's treasured possession. And from that identity, we receive our worth and we receive our function, right? We are to be a kingdom of priests. And that is so important to understand, folks. It comes from identity, and so as they're marching out, they should know we are God's people. And God has delivered us thus far. God will deliver us, right? We, they, they should be feeling their worth right now, right? They should be understanding their purpose in life, that they are to be a kingdom of priests for the whole world to know and to see that God is who he says he is. And that by knowing, by believing, they may have life in his name. And so it's so important for them, for, for, for you and I to, to know that. Now, they didn't know that because hindsight is twenty twenty, But this is, uh, this is so important. Now, what the world teaches, teaches people is that religion, right? In, in, in religion, um, our function depicts our worth and our identity. That's what religion teaches, right? Our function. So if you play a guitar, then you must be a guitarist. That's what the world teaches. If you play a guitar, you must be a guitarist. If you, if you can shoot a hoop through a, a little hole, you must be a basketball player. And your worth is you are bad to the bone. What happens when you graduate? 
What happens if you lose the state championship? What happens if you lose the regional championship? What happens is, is, is you, 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 you think of yourself less now, right? Your worth goes down and you're, you have no more identity. Now you're just an average Joe checking the post office every day, right? Now you're just an average Joe like everybody else. Why? Because you're not functioning. You're not playing basketball anymore. Well, I want to tell you that that's how the world operates. That is not how we as Christians should operate. We should have, we should be secure in our identity, right? And when we're secure in our identity as God's treasured possession, from that, we understand our worth. And from that, we know our purpose in life. And that's important, right? When we look at God's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it later on in, in um, 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll, we'll look at that just a little bit later. But I just want you to understand that right now. And here are these people, they don't understand their identity, okay? Because God, he shows who, who we are all throughout the scriptures. He is trying to pound who we are into us over and over and over. You're going to see this in the New Testament, especially, right? Jesus is going to say, you are salt, you are light, you are jars of clay. Um, you know, um, I am the vine, you are the branches, right? You are part of the family of God. You are God's treasured possession. And so we need to get this identity as sons and daughters of God. We need to get this identity that we are in Christ. And once we begin to solidify that, we're going to understand our worth, okay? And we're going to know what our purpose and our role is in life. Here, these Israelites, they have no clue. And they're like, it's best we just go back to Egypt. That's how lost they are. Crazy people, crazy people. And you see, Christians sometimes, that's how Christians are too sometimes, right? They want to go back to their old life. Why? Because they don't know their identity. They don't understand fully what their worth is. And they don't know their function. And they don't do their function. And so, here we are. These people are doing this, right? And so now we're, we're, we're in verse 13. It says, Moses answered the people. He says, don't be afraid. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. <laughs> he says, uh, he says, the Egyptians you see today will, ne will never see again. You will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. <laughs> uh, wow, that is cool. The Lord will fight for you. You need to only be still. Isn't that, isn't that refreshing? Isn't that something? Sometimes I think that we're like that little bird and Bambi. Remember those two quails when the hunters were showing up and the fire was coming and those two quails and one said, just chill out, man, stay still. And the other one couldn't chill out and stay still and it flew up in the air, got all scared and poof, and then all you see was the feathers coming down, right? Stay still. Know that the Lord is fighting for you. Don't get crazy. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to your life of sin. Just chill out, man. Know that God is going to lead you. God is going to fight your battles for you. And so he says that. So he says, um, he says, um, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. How cool is that? Uh, to go through the sea on dry ground. Can you imagine if God parted the Kachabi sound to Sosolik or something, you know, and there was a wall of sea on the left and a wall on the right, and you were able to just walk right across on dry ground? You can just wear your Crocs and you're going to be just fine. Isn't that cool? And uh, dry ground. That's how amazing God is. And that's how much he cares for you. You are his treasured possession. He don't even want you to get your feet wet. 
He don't want you to get your feet wet. That's how much he cares about you, man. He didn't say like, you know, put on your hip boots or put on your waders or, you know, put on your uh, lacrosses and stuff like that. No, man. You're going to go across on dry ground. You can walk in bare feet and crocs if you want. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he cares for you. And so he says, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots, his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And so he says, Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. How cool is that? You know, if, if only we moved forward and understood that there's, there's angels watching over us, right? Here this angel was in front of them and said, oh, I'm going to the back. I'm going to protect you guys. Uh, that's incredible. I wish we could see angels. I wish we could see God's angels fighting battles for us. It's just, I, I can't even imagine it. So, so neat. And so it says here, then the angel of God had been traveling. It says, withdrew, went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and it stood behind them. It says, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel, it says, throughout the night the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. How cool is that? That not only did this angel go behind him, but the cloud went behind him. And so the, the Egyptians were in darkness, and the Israelites were in light. That is so cool. This is a, this is a, this is powerful to know how God loves and how God cares for us, his treasured possession. And uh, what, what, he, what he's doing. Verse 21, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind, turned it into dry land, and the waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. And during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army. He threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. And the Egyptians were fleeing toward it. And the Lord swept them into the sea. And the water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea not one of them survived. How cool is that? That You see, God's plan is not only to deliver you his treasured possession, but God's plan is to just destroy the enemies in your life, right? Whatever you're pressed by in sin, if, if it's pornography or if it's a bad relationship or if, if you're stuck in a, um, a particular type of sin, God wants to destroy that, to deliver you, to live a different life, a blessed life. And so that's just so incredible that God is doing this. So again, not only did God deliver them, but he's also destroying their enemies. And so important to realize and to understand, it says none of them survived. Verse 29, but the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And that day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord had displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. All right? And they put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. This is so important. When the people saw, right? when the Israelites saw the great power that the Lord had displayed, they feared God. When you and I see God working in our lives with great power, 
we should fear God. In fear in a good sense, in, in the sense that we, we should revere Him, we should honor Him, we should praise Him, we should worship Him. That's what they're talking about here, right? And he says, and we should put our trust in Him and in Moses, His servant. So the more that we see God at work, the more we should fear Him, the more we should trust Him. And that relationship of, of fear and trust should grow ever more and ever more as we go on in our life, in our Christian walk. Verse 15, or chapter 15, it says here, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. So we're seeing this is an incredible song, right? Um, notice this is the very first thing after God delivers the Israelites and destroys their enemies. You see, God is a just God, okay? He is a just God. We need to understand that, that God it will punish sin. God will punish uh, oppression. And so he, he did that. In verse chapter 15, Moses and the Israelites sang this song, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. Right? What do we do sometimes when we get delivered? Man, you want to sing a song to God. It's a form of expression. It's an expression of worship. Right? That's it. It's a natural reaction. I remember when I first got saved, February 1995, I mean, I, I wanted to sing of his goodness to the rooftops. I wanted to let everybody know who he is, how powerful he is, how he delivered me. Man, my Egypt was a fortress. It was, I, you would have thought there was no way that Lance could be delivered from that fortress of sin. You, you know, I, I don't know, maybe my friends... <laughs> You know, they, they may see me on Facebook now and go, what, is that the same dude that I knew in high school or that I knew in college? What, what happened to him, man? There was no way that he could have been delivered. Not that guy, right? <laughs> but, man, when we get delivered, we want to sing. We want to worship. And he says, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. Uh, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My Father's God, I will exalt him. I will lift him up. He says, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them and they sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger, and it consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood firm like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. And the enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them, I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them, and they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people that you have redeemed. And in your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. He says, the leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling and the people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall upon them. By the power of your arm, they will be still as stone until your people pass by, O Lord, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, your hands established, and the Lord will reign forever and ever. It says when, in verse 19, When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them, but the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. 
And Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. How cool is that, that, uh, that, that the folks are doing what they're supposed to do. They understand their identity as God's treasured possession. That he, he wants them to be this holy nation, this kingdom of priests. And, and again, when we have our identity, we're going to understand what our worth is. And they are learning their worth now, right? And they're understanding their, their role and their purpose in life is to be a kingdom of priests. What do priests do as we look back in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2? Let's take a look. They are there to offer uh, sacrifices, right? Holy sacrifices uh, unto God. And so let me look at that real quick. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says in verse, um, okay, in verse 4, As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you're precious to him. It says, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so we are to be that, right? This, um, we're precious to him. And like living stones, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices. We are a kingdom of priests. It says... Um, in verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That's us as Christians. So we see here that this tale of these Israelites really is a shadow or a precursor of who we are as God's treasured possession, as Christians, as people who follow Christ. It says, um, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Isn't that what Moses and Miriam were doing? They were declaring the praises of him who called them out of darkness and into the wonderful light. Right? Remember, the darkness was behind them. The light was ahead of them. And so he says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so it's so important, I think, to understand that um, from this we can learn that we are God's treasured possession. And because of that, we can know our self worth. And so that's my goal for you. How do you get out of the rut that you're in? How do you make it out of? Uh, slavery. How do you make it out, right? Number one, you have to go through the Passover. Number one, you have to have the blood of the Lamb. And secondly, you need to follow God and trust in Him and understand that His plans for your life are better than your plans for your life, right? He will lead you. He will guide you in your life. And uh, I'm just going to kind of share with you a very quick story. Years ago, when I became a Christian, I was a teacher. I taught elementary school, third and fourth grade at JNES, and, and I loved it. It was incredible. Um, and I had great students. We still have a great relationship today. And I, I wouldn't change that for the world. But guess what? God led me um, out of that and, and into ministry. And you see, God called me to be a holy nation. God called me in to be a kingdom of priests. And I'm to be a priest. You are to be a priest. The whole plan was for all of us to be a kingdom of priests. Not just pastors, not just evangelists, not just those who share the word of God in front of the church. Every Christian, every follower of God is to be a priest. That only changed at Mount Sinai at the giving of the law when idolatry happened, when they were worshiping the golden calf and God said, hey, the, the ones following me on this side, the ones this side, you, you go to war. And, and it was the Levites who were on this side who wanted to follow after God's holiness. And so it was them that was declared these priests. And it just kind of dwindled and dwindled and dwindled over the years to what we have now, right? 
But that wasn't the original plan. The original plan was for the, all of these two million Israelites to, to march out as God's treasured possession, to know their worth, and to offer spiritual sacrifices unto God. That is, to there to give their life. We're to be a living sacrifice, right? And so we're to give our lives over to the Lord and to what He wants in our lives. And what happens when we do that is that people will see the difference in us. And they will say, I can see how God is working in this person's life. I can see how God is protecting this person. I can see that God is blessing them. I want to live this life. And so God delivered me, right? And and, and over the years, he guided me out of teaching um, into ministry. He guided me out of um, even secular youth camps into doing Christian youth camps. He, I was a tour guide at one time. Maybe Beatrice, you probably remember. Uh, but I was a tour guide for Nana. I would wonder, why am I a tour guide? What, what, what's the purpose of this? And, uh, and so eventually I, I was a... I was a janitor. I was a night watchman man. I, I cleaned toilets and I walked through buildings in, in you know, dark of, uh, in darkness and sometimes. And so what I didn't know that as I was going through these things, that God was preparing me for ministry. He was preparing me the whole time for ministry. You see, he leads us and he guides us in this life. You just trust him and to know. You may not know what he's doing, in this particular chapter, in this particular place you're in on the road. You may not know, but just know, be still like Moses said. Be still and let him fight your battles. Let him lead you. Let him guide you. He knows what he's doing. You just have to be still in knowing that your worth is like that, right? How do you know your worth? Christ died on the cross for you. That was God's only son. That is like the most worth there ever is in the world. And so be still in that and say, if he loves me that much, cares for me that much, I'm going to trust that he's going to get me through this. And so that is our, our aim and our wish for you. And uh, we hope that you've really enjoyed uh, today's lesson. And we look forward to next week as we get into water and manna and quail. And, and we're going to get into what's called God's provision next week. You see, God, when God leads you out in a procession, he's not just going to leave you out there hung to dry. He's going to make sure that he's taking care of you. right? He's going he's gonna, to uh, provide for you everything that you need for life and godliness. And so... Hey, this has been Lance Kramer with Changepoint Cots of You. Again, I hope that you've enjoyed this message. Be still and let the Lord fight for you.